All right, welcome to Future Sounds. This is season two, episode three, the Dan Mason Love in an Elevator special. Um, we've got a slightly different format this time. We split into two camps. We've got the sort of home base. So I'm joined by Rob and Joe. And we've also got two roving reporters who uh, traveled via Zoom to interview the man himself, Dan Mason. So, uh, Rob, how's it going? What's new with you? I'm good. I'm good. I just got back from uh, a little trip to Bavaria. That was a, that was a, that was an eye opener. Wh- it was nice, man. We went skiing for one day. Mm-hmm. Um, we went to Munich and then out to uh, Garmisch. And I hadn't appreciated. I told you guys in a WhatsApp that um, the uh, uh, mandatory nudity for uh, saunas. Mm. Uh, that was that was that was super interesting. Um, so that was uh, that was cool, man. Yeah, it was really lovely. Just like four days of just like getting away from everything, and then come back and uh, doing a little bit of freelancing. I think, I think you're in a place called Wank, weren't you? Place, place called uh, Wank. The Wank, Wank Mountain was was very nearby. It was recommended as a, but there was I was sat in one of the saunas and I, and I I wasn't into the coup then. I didn't know what was going on, so I I was wearing a swim That's shorts, a shame. sticky thick swim shorts. <laughs> I know. And I looked out the window, and this is in Garmisch, and there was a lovely massive sign that just said Wank, and I thought, well, well why not? I probably <laughs> when, when it because I'm when in Wank, mind. so to speak. Yeah, <laughs> when, well, exactly. Um, but no, it was super nice, man, and it was uh, it was really nice weather. It was really hot up there. Yeah, night, that, 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 that tell you what, the skiing picture, in, in sprite, brilliant yeah. sunshine. The sky is so much bluer when you're sort of higher up the mountain. The the, the image looked mm-hmm. great. And a random fact, I th- didn't need. My I thermals. think um, didn't they film Eddie the Eagle at Garmisch Park and Kirschkeim? Oh, they might. I believe have done. that's where they filmed it. Yeah, <clears throat> they might have done. Very beautiful yeah, place. Very nice. Um, so the kid, the kid learned to ski in like four hours. That's nice. Boom, done. Probably. We'll probably never go skiing again. Aww. But he's got that. Uh, he's, he's got that unnecessary skill now. You could go to the Milton Keynes Snow Dome. Yeah. Yes, we could. Yeah, I think there's one in, in Birmingham. Hemel Hempstead. Well. I reckon it's. Do they use like fake snow now, or is it that funny old like hexagonal? construction yeah i think, that, I think that's low tech isn't it the carpet the sort of slidey carpet i think that's yeah the past, that's it? probably oh good that's probably i think like they've got like real snow stuff. if you go to like saudi arabia or qatar or dubai like <laughs> dubai have like, got yeah, the bit largest my... indoor slope i think it's like half a mile in length from top to bottom and it's actually got two indoor chairlifts which is just insane oh, i know that that's excessive. i know over exuberance gr- great for the environment isn't it mm. so yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. T- talking Joe of um, talking of uh, wank, um, I think this episode yep. is going to be wank. littered with sort of US UK sort of English translation errors. So you know, I, I don't I don't think <laughs> wank is really a, a US English term. And right, we're going to be repeatedly using the term lift. In fact, um, Enzo and Patrick <laughs> Fakeman use the term lift repeatedly uh, when interviewing Dan Mason about his elevator record. So you know, perfect. Uh, some translation required. That, that's All that's right, Joe. Joe yeah, that's, that's, that's where ended. I come in. So I'm the expert. So lift mm-hmm. equals elevator. Boom. There you go. Am I um, done? Can I? Yeah, can I go now? Done. Yeah. We're, we're, nice we're, we're aiming to keep this Perfect. intro brief. So um, very efficient. Very very efficient. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> what about you, dudes? What have you been up to? I've just been in the studio all weekend. It's been it's been really nice. Um, but it hasn't felt much of a weekend. You know, in terms of a break from from my day job, which is teaching. But um. I was doing some vocals for the new Dona Lens stuff with Yana Tyrrell, oh, yes. which is cool. Um, oh, I've been mastering the Flamingo Funk compilation, which we're going to chat about in a second. Um, and I had a studio session today with like my jam band, Habraxis, and we were actually recording a tune about a sauna. So, uh, <laughs> oh, there you go. We're all back there, yeah. Link. Yeah. Segway. Everything, everything's linked. Um, Naked saunas. Has anyone got any sort of news uh relevant to the scene has anyone been to any shows recently or, or heard anything that's kind of relevant to other sessions <clears throat> well I, we've all just missed the we, Jacks we one, did apparently we? it it Space went Jam. well um memrex memories unfortunately caught covid so he never ended up playing oh, but no. apparently thorison uh pulled the biggest audience of the night apparently that was massively successful uh, marvel 83 oh, uh, made a good set as well um yeah uh, generally it sounds like about the new arcades, guys. Uh, do you know what? I've not. I've, that, that was the worst I've not bit. Spoke, right? Yeah, Adam, if you're listening, come on, mate. Come on. <laughs> just just because your love of music has gone down doesn't mean you can't keep trying hard, my friend. Try. <laughs> come on. No, I. This, I've this heard, was a big synthwave event in Bristol. Was it? What, what was the name of the event? Sunset Boulevard. Um, mm-hmm. And it, and Jack in a has, big venue, I hear. 
Nice wintry um, I think it was quite low. Oh, no, I think before that, they there was a Dusk Waves event, and they were, mm. they, <laughs> it was like a 330, 340 <laughs> person mm. uh, venue. And I mean, I think it was a free event as well. So, you know, hopefully you would hope that people saw the posters and, and turned up because, of course, it's always good to fill out a room. But that is pretty big for Synthwave. I mean, that's... Yeah. Was Duet there? Duet was there. Because he was yeah. playing Bristol the night yeah, before, Duet. was it? Was it Rough Trade? It was oh, Yeah, Rough, rough trade. trade Bristol. That's it. Yeah, I saw a picture. Nice, yeah. nice. Okay, good. That's cool. And uh, we're in, Infraviolet we're playing. Is that right? Or maybe not. Oh. I might have made that up. They might have been. They do lots, play which is, yeah. everywhere yeah. at the moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, tour like they're, they're touring a lot, yeah. Mm. No, it's good. I think um, it's the first um, synthwave uh, event of the year. I think the next one coming up is at the end of April, which is LeBrock and Wolf Club, you know, two prominent uh, acts within the scene. Um, who... Wolf Club have just played. Yeah, I played a gig with, with Wolf Club uh, yeah. this, this very last, last weekend, yeah. How was it? How was it, man? Did you go? Yeah, so I've, I've kind of been to two shows uh, since we last uh, did a pod. So the, the first one was the... Barber Beats, um, Allo City's event at Folklore, which was really interesting. Oh. Like I, I kind of collected my thoughts a little bit um, for the Future Sounds website. I wrote a little bit about it. Um, it was really interesting. It's like it's a it, uh, unusual music to perform live. It's so new. Like I don't think um, uh, people quite know how to perform th- this music and how to dance to this music yet. It's kind of every, finding its feet. Um, I mean, it's for, for, for yeah. the for the Luddites. How would you describe uh, Barba Beats? How would you define it? Well, that, I mean, that's that's kind of um, why it's it's hard to perform and hard to dance it because um, I mean, it's quite a provocative and controversial kind of uh, niche and genre which um, involves like heavily sampled kind of lounge and down tempo tunes, which they've kind of down tempoed even further, I guess. So that so that <laughs> you know. I guess like how Vaporwave takes, um, you know, 70s and 80s kind of soul and city pop samples and kind of uh, makes them all soupy. The yeah, makes them all soupy. Um, this kind of does similar techniques, but with music that was already quite slow and soupy to begin with. And, you know, uh, yeah, kind of making electronic music out of samples of electronic music. Um, absolutely massive on Bandcamp and on YouTube with a very distinctive mm. like visual style. Um, my takeaway from the gig haircuts was... Haircuts for yeah. men. Yeah, haircuts, haircuts for men kind of, kind of kicked it all off. I think uh, like everybody's kind of um, visual aesthetic uh, kind of uh, draws from from his kind of um, starting point. But yeah, it's, it's cool. And, uh, you know, the, the music's um, really interesting and it was nice to hear it on a big sound system. And like um, as the night went on, like people were playing more dancey tunes and it was, you know, a nice little, you know, like a nice little club night. Um but yeah, I think just because the visual aesthetic is super strong, um, I think f- in future events, I think they could they could make it more visually arresting. I think. Mm. But um, you know, you, you fall asleep to the slushy. Well, the, the slush wave. yeah, the the first the first act uh, sleep wave was was super super loungy, and actually, like people were just kind of lounging around on the chairs and stuff, and playing with that lovely cat at folklore. So. Um, oh. It kind of worked for sure, um, but yeah, like quite sort of down tempo for early on a Saturday night. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, th- there was that, um, and then yeah, there w- it was a synthwave show. So Wolf Club and Iverson in Camden at the Black Heart. Um, really interesting show. Like really, really interesting. So I was uh, actually me and Jay uh, were both performing as part of Iverson, and um, we got evacuated mid set. What? Um, so, oh, bollocks. so like the kind of um, I don't know what you'd call him. He was kind of functioning as a kind of compare, but I guess he must have been like the booker or the you know the venue manager. He kind of got up on stage whilst we were playing La Favier, I think, and he was like, "Everybody needs to get out of here right now." What? <laughs> Holy shit! And then like so people too hot. People started milling out, and then he was like, "Oh no, no, actually, it's fine." And then, <laughs> and then it, he just really hates Lefavier. Yeah, yeah. Well, I thought I thought he was like maybe the crowd wasn't like hype enough for his liking. He was quite a sort of theatrical kind of extrovert <laughs> guy. I was like, what's this guy doing? Like, I think I thought he was like taking matters into his own, ha- own hands to kind of create like a situation, like make <laughs> no, things uh, an emergency. <laughs> but yeah. I, I, anyway, like it, it was a false alarm, and then then he was like, no, no, for real this time. We need to get out. And um. We all went outside. Well, the cried wolf over here. Yeah, we've got a wolf club, right? Um, 
<laughs> boy the crowd wolf club um that's funny um but anyway we were all outside the the pub and this guy was like uh, i've got a confession to make like one of the beer lines exploded and gas was going everywhere holy shit um Blimey. so that's not uh, they took about 20 30 sorry. minutes to sort that out and then then we got back up on stage and, and finished our set and it's it's one of those things you know like when something goes wrong at a gig the worst thing to do is like throw your toys out the pram and like you know, like mm. if your instruments aren't working or like you're forgetting bits of your songs or whatever, like you can actually, if you recover well from it and you play well from that point onwards and you really get the audience on side, those those can be the best gigs rather than yeah. a gig that's like workmanlike and, and functional and memorable, right? So mm. um, I think I've always, yeah, I've always enjoyed a gig evening. where you can see adversity up on stage and the band have overcome it. You, yeah. you're, you're sort of, you're willing them on and you really want everything yeah. to go swimmingly and you just have this i don't know an additional connection so yeah i think i i think i know yeah. where you're coming from i think josh is really into that i think what josh is like preferred aesthetic is to rehearse the band until we're like freaking tight and then he wants things to go wrong on stage and introduce loosen like a bit of chaos yeah. and loosen it yeah, yeah. I, I think i'm just into that kind of aesthetic <clears throat> in general it's just like i prefer i generally prefer like uh people Loose doing wave. experimental things from a point of like like really knowing their technique or being able to make immaculate things and then choosing to do something that's a little bit kind of rough and ready or lo-fi rather than like mm. accidentally or in a, inadvertently stumbling across something good. I think that's just my preferred aesthetic in general. <clears throat> we, were, we were chatting about that a little while ago in the context of the Beatles, weren't we? Mm -hmm. We're saying that they, their the professionalism reached such a standard that they could make uh, uh, number nine. Yeah. Uh, but, but you couldn't just fuck about and make that without already having the basis of yeah. musical expertise and knowledge. Um, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I think, I think I agree with that in general. When um, I was getting the train back, I think it was with Duet, if I remember rightly, back to Canterbury after his uh, set in London. I, I remember saying to him, oh, it's such a shame that you, know, you had that little technical glitch and everything and yeah, it must have knocked your confidence. And he sort of slyly hinted at mm, there may have been a bit of, you know, purpose to that because, you know, so it can sometimes get the audience more on side. I was like, oh, OK. So, yeah, I think... Wait, it was a, a manufactured incident. Well, yeah. Uh, so, you know... And the reassurance Yeah, and that's it. And, you know, I think um, perhaps it's something that I certainly wasn't aware of that might actually be more prominent yeah. in live music than I originally thought so uh, yeah, yeah interesting the, the the big sort of conspiracy theory at the moment right so there's this um artist who's absolutely everywhere at the moment called fred again in the sort of electronic music worlds and he's there's clips of you know he's come from seemingly nowhere to kind of playing madison square gardens with skrillex and fortet and he's just like you know this random yeah. british guy yeah. but he kind of blew up from a boiler room set and the the clip that was doing the rounds was him like doing his set and some random guys dancing too exuberantly and press his stop on the decks um, and hmm. like that's like the big viral moment, and like people are like, "Is this guy planted?" You know, like yeah. manufactured. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's, well, you know, I think we think we're all suckers for it, right? Something something goes wrong, um, and then um, it's quickly rectified, and you know that's that's more exciting than if nothing had ever gone wrong. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, no, it's a powerful tactic. Record. If anyone out there is a music maker, you know. Um, just uh, introduce some chaos, uh, manufactured or otherwise. You know? <laughs> Me and Rob used to do it quite a lot on the old Forever Since show. Um, for anyone, for anyone that remembers, Jesus, <laughs> yeah, pretty much every week we would deliberately make something go wrong with the desk. And there was, uh, there was one that was particularly bad with Primo. Very uh, bad. Primo that, that involved Where a lot of online up. swearing. Yeah, that sounds went stressful. Out, what, I, th I think mm. about six or seven swear words went out live on yeah, air. Yeah, tea time, on your tea time <laughs> slot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it was, and they were, they were, they were great radio. swear words as well, like real, you know, some real oomph. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Nice. Did we get our wrist slap for that? Or was, uh, I think we, we got, got away, away with it, it because, um, well, we, we apologised, <laughs> which is, which is the first yeah, thing. So straight to, away, yeah. you avoid the £5,000 fine, um, just, just for apologising. Is that what it is? And then, so it's five 5000 for the first instance. If it happens again, it's then twenty five thousand. There's a hundred and twenty five. It's it's five. It, it's five times each time. That it, yeah, wow. basically. God, live radio, yeah. man. That was frightening. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> um, I've got ten minute ten minutes left on the Zoom. I reckon we can do it at a push. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's so, do it. Um, couple of couple of things to chat about. So this is like a bit <laughs> of an exclusive. Sort of half mentioned it already, but um. One exciting well, thing that's on the horizon. Yeah, exclusive. Exclusive. Um, 
is uh, Flamingo Funk Volume Three is finally coming out, which is really exciting. Um, so that's something that I've been I've been working on the vinyl master of this all weekend, um, and uh, we've all been kind of reviewing tracks from it as well. Um, um, some of the things you were you were talking about in describing Orograph's music is uh, kind of equally relevant to Dan Mason, particularly this electric elevator. Uh, sort of a double collection that that uh, is the main focus of our interview because um, you know Dan Mason's not really a synthwave guy, but this um, electric elevator thing in particular definitely kind of goes in the kind of direction of of somebody like Mitch Murder and somebody like mm-hmm. Office Science Collective um, and people like Eyeliner and FM Skyline and stuff like it's it's not sort of sample based vaporwave, yeah. it's like MIDI composition for sure. Yeah. So um, you know that's that it's it's kind of a little little genre of its own, isn't it? It seems to yeah. sit somewhere in between, Agreed. like super synthwave and super vaporwave. The uh, the artwork was done by our good buddy Glenn, right? Mm-hmm. What's he um, tasked to, to to put together the design for this? And it features like a a, a very handsome lift or elevator, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and your neck oh, of the woods, Joe. Oh, well, a mi- it's a Mitsubishi. It, it, it is a Mitsubishi. The uh, the Rolls Royce of uh, elevators, certainly in the UK. Um, <laughs> very very expensive. Your average four to six floor Mitsubishi is probably going to set you back about eighty thousand pounds, which is about thirty thousand more than your average lift. Uh, their class is an MRL, which stands for Machine Rimless Lift, which means all of the gubbins is inside the shaft, nothing outside. They are smooth, elegant. Oof. You've got lots of choices to decorate the uh, the interior. They 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 truly are a ten out of ten lift. I do like it when everything's in the, inside mm. the shaft. That's, that, uh, that was like a, a partridge voice over. I like yeah. that. <laughs> really well. Yeah. Brought to you ten, by... 10 on 10. Uh, brought 10 on 10. But I, I, one criticism, I would like uh, you know some more space between the, the egg and the beans. Maybe use the sausages of breakwater. <laughs> oh, man. Um, <laughs> we're going to play um, a Dan Mason track um, to kind of ease into... Um, the interview section. I think maybe very quickly, I'll ju- I'm just going to bang through a few more details about this compilation because I know it's something that people are really excited about. Um, I think one of the most important things to, to stress is that these compilations are always uh, raising money for charity. Um, and uh, the boys were, in fact, on the, the front page of the local newspaper handing over oh, a big oh, check yeah. Yeah, very um, cool. with the proceeds from, from, <coughs> from previous Flamingo Funk. and the Morgan's um, Finest. Uh, what are, they, what are the Time Slave compilations called? Are they called Future Sounds? Oh, God. Got... No, they're not. <laughs> yeah, Future Sounds. Future Sounds, Volume 1, 2, and 3, yeah. I think. Oh, and, very, and, and, very, and very confusing. Flamingo Funk and Flamingo Funk. Yeah. Very confusing. I've go. got a bunch of them. And this was, for, they're often for mental health charities, right? And this one was uh, benefiting Mind, I think. Yeah, so... That, so or the last one benefited Mind? Yeah, I think, and, and there's always local charities as well. So this one's going to Shelter, which is a homeless charity. Alban, which is uh, works with sort of young people with learning disabilities. Um, in London, uh, raising money for a boxing gym in Barry, um, and uh, Edge Kimru, which is uh, making life better for older people. So, um, oh yeah, That's and uh, good. Good, a, th- good a thousand pounds to the, the community cricket club in Cardiff as well. Nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> pretty, pretty, it's, it's pretty big, the money. Dude, pretty far big and players, wide. aren't you? You're, you're certainly big players yeah, in, in, yeah. in the North, uh, North, 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 Norfolk area, and Glamorgan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think they want they want them to name the cricket ground after them, don't they? The sort of my pet flamingo arena. Uh, or something. That's what they're yeah. for. It. That would, yeah, that'd be it, great. Man. Perfect. But yeah, anyway, I'm I've been sort of knee deep in this music because I've been working on the on the master all weekend, and it's it's really exciting. There's some absolute bangers. Um, the sequencing is fantastic. Um, I've got nothing to do with it. It's actually um, uh, Enzo J and um, Eric Hughes from Sly Vinyl has helped uh, put together the the sequencing and it flows really, really well. Record's coming out on March 17th. Um, artworks by Victor, Arch- Victor Arche, who um, did uh, the Miracle Lounge uh, Donor Lens artwork. Um, oh, lovely. Um, and the previous compilations. Um, very, very distinctive visual style. Um, I'm just going to really like bang through some of the artists on this. St. Pepsi, Fiber, This Candy, Timeshare 94, Strawberry Station, The Cross... Synchro Star, Melanade, Conscious Thoughts, Mac Lacrosse, confusingly, Mac Cross and Mac Lacrosse. I can't wait to get my grubby mitts on this. Yeah, and they are grubby. I'm guessing this is a, a double disc affair, I would have thought. So that's 27 odd tracks, I think. Oh, that is. Must be over two, two slabs of wax. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, wicked. Um, but yeah, it's fantastic. There's Future Funk, there's Vaporwave, and um, some very experimental stuff, some kind of dance floor stuff. It's um, it's a really, really, really good listen. And, you know, uh, plenty of things that have never been on vinyl before. Oh, <coughs> oh no. Timed out. Right. All right. Uh, ease us into the interview portion of this episode with Dan Mason. We're going to play really beautiful sort of vocal Vaporwave track, Vaporwave 2.0 track called never did very romantic very very well produced i think sample free um unashamedly sample free and uh if you want to call it vaporwave great if you don't want to call mm-hmm. it vaporwave then that's fine that's as well that's not vaporwave yeah maybe not but it's a really lovely piece of music um enjoy never did by dan mason So you knew it was a Mitsubishi lift, though, right? You I did, know. yeah. I got it from their website. 
but you probably you didn't spend as long as Glenn did researching lift manuals, no, and like looking for the decal on the interior metallic finish buttons and no, stuff. No, I yeah. I just I literally looked up electric elevator when I made the first one, and it was just one of the album. It was just like a, a like a demo picture, like giving yeah, yeah. like a slice of it, and I just I was like, oh, that looks really cool, and I just took it and put like a a uh, film grain filter over it really that's all i really did maybe change the background color a little bit like and that's it for the first one and the second one then i made it kind of like match the theme i tried to line them up to be the same got them from the same website uh i think it's literally a website where you buy elevators for your business well (laughs) it's it's funny you should say that because joe who's on the podcast um he is a lift engineer yeah. And uh, he he's very impressed with your choice of lift. He he did, he has got a question, so I think we'll 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 pipe that in. We might as well kick off with that. To be fair, <laughs> okay. I think we should. Right. So rather than piping it in, I'll I'll say. So, but roughly, what he's asked is, he said, as an as a lift engineer myself, I was very impressed by your choice of the Mitsubishi lift which uh, is, a, is a lift that i tend to personally associate with the word prestige oh. did you uh, did you give much thought to your choice of lift when coming up with the album cover <laughs> not really uh <laughs> just looked up electric elevator and the first thing that came up uh, well not the first thing but like a little bit down on google images was this really cool cut out picture of the mitsubishi uh uh, yeah. Elevator, and I was just you don't like, you don't know the model name, do you? I didn't know the model. I mean, I clicked on the website because you got to go to direct to the website to yeah. download the higher resolution picture, so that you don't get like artifacts or anything. And it was Mitsubishi. I was like, oh, I didn't know they they made elevators too. So I was yeah, like, oh, I've heard of their cars. I've I've heard they make aviation equipment, but I mean, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, it's well, all. He, I've got a rec- I've got I've got a record player by Mitsubishi though as oh, well. Yeah. So I think they must oh, make, just they make TVs everything. At one point too. Yeah, yeah for sure. probably. I don't know. They yeah, make well, a lot there of we things. Are. There we are. Well, we've been we've been reassured uh, by by uh, Joe that you picked the right kind of lift because lesser lifts can cause uh, workplace disasters. That's what so. I'm talking about. Well done. Mr. I Mason. did it. Well, uh, and if you become a, a multimillionaire and you, and you choose to get one in your in your mansion, then you know it's uh, safe. Yes, I'll I'll, I'll make you sure know? you get the Mitsubishi. I'll make sure. Get the Mitsubishi. <laughs> What's sad? And then jo- jo- well, Joe can come and service it as well oh. after that. You know? What's kind of interesting is <laughs> that Glenn, Glenn, who did the rework for the art, for the, the tape release that we've just done, he clearly spent a lot more time than any of us yes. uh, researching this. <laughs> so, uh, that, that artwork came out amazing. I, as yeah. soon as I saw that, I was like, this is perfect. Perfect for the combo. It's like, well, he would enjoy hearing that. I think he, um, yeah, he puts a yeah. lot, puts a lot of heart into it, and we're always really super grateful because um, he's a good friend and a good friend of the pod. He does a lot of the artwork rela- related to the pod and helps us out quite a lot with both labels. So he's a good guy, and I think he was quite pleased to uh, get the chance to work with you. And he really loves the album, which is really cool as well. So that, hey, that's that's a bonus. Right that's there, a bonus yeah. as well, isn't it? <laughs> so why don't we start with that? We're we're joined by uh, Dan Mason, none other than uh, Mr. Miami Virtual, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Lim. Liminal space, the Lord of the Liminal Spaces. Um, yeah. Is that the official title? That's a good yeah, title. Yeah, I, I was riffing on this in my head. I had something better worked out earlier on, but I thought, you know, let's not be too pre-prepared. Let's not stage it too much. But no, it's, it's great to have you with us. Uh, it's it's, it's me, here. Enzo, and we've got Mr. Patrick Fakeman. And uh, yeah, it's just nice to have a chance to chat not long after the release of Electric Elevator. I suppose we might as well kick off with that. We kind of done the the boring detail of the lift itself, so I think we can park, <laughs> we can, we can park that now. Um, I just wondered, like for me, what was interesting with that is it, it's an album or two albums that I've been fascinated for with for a while, and I'm kind of interested in this idea of liminal spaces. You know, that kind of it seems to me that you're trying to conjure up the transition between the lobby, the lift, and the boardroom. Yeah, know, that kind. Yeah. Um, can you kind of tell us a bit about how the album came together and kind of paint a picture of the story that you're telling with them? So the first one, uh, I, I got to turn my mic down a little bit. Uh, my first one, uh, it was more like a, it was a, it was literally just a writing exercise. Really, I was just playing around with some like ways of like writing chords and just putting things together. And I was like, oh, I can make kind of like smooth, jazzy kind of sounding things. And mm-hmm. uh, basically what I did was I, I said, let's not use any of the more like advanced kind of synthesizers. Like, let's use just the DX7 with its like presets, barely any effects on it. And so that's what the first one came out of. Um, and, I, and I was just like, this feels like elevator music to me. That's I was like, this is perfect. So, you know, I got like 
made all these songs like they sound like stock music that you would hear in like a thing and like a, maybe like a promotional video or like a like a informational video educational video or something that you get like at an office um and then the second one was kind of a similar thing i would just sometimes i'd just sit down but i got a new synthesizer for this one it was the uh korg m1 and i was like oh this is <coughs> perfect midi sound effects right here this sounds and it sounded even more like the office thing and i kind of just put it all together and I'm starting to piece it together. I'm like, oh, this song kind of feels like it could be like, this is your morning commute or like, this is you getting up, getting that cu first cup of coffee. And then this one here's it got like a, like a tension where it's like, it's kind of like, oh, it's like almost like vacation sounding, but it also has like a little bit of a tension before it. It's like, oh, that sounds like when you're like trying to like get days off at work. And it's just like, mm, I don't know, we can do that for you. And I was like, I was trying to get those feels. <laughs> and it was like, that that's kind of perfect for what I'm doing here. Um, was it always a plan to do a two parter or no? Uh, I made the first one. It's quite a, quite a big gap, isn't it? Between yeah, it was like 2017, I think, or 2018, yeah. and uh, I I made that one just as kind of like a one off, just like let me get my bearings into because this is when I first first trying to do sampleless vaporwave yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, let me try doing my hand at this, like making it sound more vapor wavy, making it sound more kind of that style. And it was just really more just like a practice exercise. And the second one just kind of happened because I just kept making tracks like that for fun, really. Um, and I had enough of them that I was like, I could make this another album. I can make Electric yeah. Elevator Second Floor here. Uh, and my wife like insisted that it be called Second Floor. So I was like, okay, <laughs> yeah, it's got to be. Yeah, man, <laughs> so. definitely. Because it's got kind of Sims vibes as well. I'm not sure if mm -hmm. you're familiar with, uh, and when you said the DX7, this really stuck, struck a chord even more. The Mitch Murder um, stuff that he's done. Are you familiar with Mitch Murder? I've so he's kind heard of, of Mitch Murder. I seen as like more synthwave. He's yeah. more, seen as more synth, like a pioneer of synthwave. But he's also done this um, Salary Man. Is it called Salary Man Simulator? And he's done parts one, I two, and three. It's quite yeah, a short right, EP, yeah. and it's got very similar kind of Muzak uh, computer game, maybe yeah. like um, uh, N Nintendo Wii kind of vibes. Oh, I love that shit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I am de I'm it's, definitely it's, inspired by like the Sims, like Sims One and like Sim City Four, or like my like big inspirations to me in general. So like, okay. I, yeah, I, that's that's yeah, that's a good shit right there. Nice. Yeah, I, I, I've heard of Mitch Burr. I don't think I've like delved in. Joe, I'm gonna look, I'll link you up after, and oh, we'll please. we'll put we'll put a link in the description as well. But it's kind of I think he's trying to achieve the same kind of feeling of that uh, mm. that soulless corporate. Um, maybe, maybe okay. Maybe he's making a bit more of a soulless corporate statement. Perhaps it seems like you're more kind of in love with the idea of taking that journey into the office. It's and... more. It's kind of more sarcastic in that take. Is what I was kind of go with it. It's like, okay. yeah, okay. like I'm having a good time, but like, look how stressful it was for um for me to yeah. ask for uh, time off. It's like, yeah, like I'm gonna get the time off, but it's like a fucking pain in the ass. And then uh, like the song uh, on Electric Elevator Two, um, Economic Forecast is supposed to be like. It's kind of almost. It's got like this negative, like what's going to happen? We don't know, kind of thing, and and then yeah, sorry, we can't it, afford to give you a pay rise this year. Mr. Yeah, Mason. sorry, look at look, looking at the economic forecast. It's, it's not looking good for us this year, you know, and it's, so. But it's funny, isn't it? Because that uh, the, the there's that there's a subgenre of what well, people loosely call office wave, mm -hmm. which is that kind of um, Mitch Murder, the vibe with it, Robert Parker, that well. kind of. Im Definitely the, the early Parker stuff, and that definitely embraces that sort of things where it sounds like you're very much like you know kind of ripping the shit out of that <laughs> that face that face of it, which is which, which is good, which but, I, and I like that because ultimately it's come to that kind of similar. But isn't it sound, isn't it but, interesting that they both come from different angles? So you've got these people like Mitch yeah. Murray and Robert Parker who've come from a synth wave end where they're doing original synth driven compositions using similar instruments you've come off the back of a very sample heavy scene and you said yourself this was kind of like a learning exercise as mm -hmm. you found your way into um trying to recreate the same feelings and emotions as you were with sample music presumably or in similar yeah. anyway but to do it from your own original compositions and you found kind of the same statement and the same <laughs> kind of sound as these people who came from very different starting points yes yeah, that's interesting honestly yeah yeah, it means we all fucking hate work. That's what it means. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> honestly. Oh, um, God. Okay. Well, um, we were we were lucky enough ourselves to catch you playing live last year at Electronicon um, last summer. Like, what was that experience like for you as an artist? Like, have you had many chances to play for a crowd as big as that? So the last time I played for a crowd that size would be... <coughs> 
uh, Econ 1 and 2. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But other than Electronicon, honestly, no. Uh, I remember before Electronicon, the first one, I was playing a show in Orlando, um, and it was like a, the room was full, uh, but it was like it was like 35, maybe 40 people in that room. And then going from that to a room full of like 200 plus people in, uh, in New York was just like within like three months later, basically. I was like three months later, I'm in New York playing to a room that's full of freaking people. And then same thing in L.A. And then, of course, this time, freaking at Econ 3, the room was so full, nobody could get in. <laughs> Well, that that yeah, that room that was crazy. Room was too my, small. My, my 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 sort of residing memory of that, and that was the, obviously the earlier part of the day was just how damn hot it was. It was yeah. very hot, and it was like that I was the first was act. So crazy. I was the first act. Yeah. I'm like, oh man, this is already hot in here. I think um, when you look on the website though, like. It looks way bigger than it actually is in person. It's yeah. tiny. It's tiny. It was a tiny room, but it was. It there was still a lot of people because it was on two levels. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, or at least two levels anyway, because there was a was guy like who two, helped one and helped and me up. Yeah. It was like- it was that guy that was pulling us yeah, all up. Yeah, he was like he, he was being the hero. I think I sure. caught the first fifteen minutes, and I'm, I'm I've said this to Lux as well when I saw her set. I had to clear out after a little while because it got too much. It was very like I hot. Was, I was sweating out, and we were we were filming and stuff there for the, oh, for the yeah. documentary as well. So it was kind of like intense. But I think Chris got right up and was filming you on stage as well. Oh, but do you, do you find that do you find that kind of thing? Um, overwhelming like is it is it frightening or do you just feel like a sense because there was a lot of love in the room and i I think think that would have been quite quite something to experience the crowd obviously helps make it not as overwhelming and the yeah the amount of love in that room was just like oh i i don't i don't feel uh uh like nervous at all anymore like i was nervous like building up to (laughs) it and i was like but honestly the nerves kind of they kind of help like make it like oh this is an exciting thing uh, it's more like an excitement and like, uh, I, I mean, also there's the, you know, I hope nothing goes wrong kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of something... sports people say that though, don't they? If you don't feel nervous, there's something wrong. Yeah. It, Cause it, 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 it honestly means like to me, at least if I'm not nervous going into something, it means like, I do I really care about this? Yeah. That's fair. Like, and it's like, obviously being nervous means like you care about this. It's, it's, an, it's important to you. And yeah, going up there, I was very nervous. And then like, I got up there and I saw the crowd and the crowd was very welcoming. And I was like, okay. This is going to be fun. This is just going to be a good time up here, and we're going to have fun. So it was great. And was that the case? Was that the case on the first occasion as well? When you said about uh, Econ One yes. as well, when you've gone from like a, a smaller, a smaller crowd to the the size that it yeah, was. Yeah, uh, honestly, the, the the crowd at um all, at all three Econs has been very welcoming. I, I think the I, first one was mm. a shock because it was the first time anyone had done anything that big. So you probably had a bit more preparation when you came to parts two and three. Oh yeah, parts two and three. I was like, I was like, oh this is what i'm expecting like part one was like oh yeah. this is a lot more than i was i was gonna, yeah, was mad. i thought i was gonna see yeah <laughs> so. we just arrived to the queues around the block like we'd yeah. flown over from the uk me and my brother we didn't make electronic on two but electronic on one is one of the greatest experiences in music uh, that i've ever been involved it in. was um, it was amazing and to, to be uh and i opened up on the on the main like floor there and i was just really fucking cool to yeah, be there and just do that it's really awesome yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, do you find it easy as a vaporwave artist, or like, I guess for you because you were kind of. Well, am I right in thinking that you coined the phrase vaporwave 2.0, or that you were one of the first to adopt I, that? It was, it was kind of a joke that I did. Yeah, I thought and it just I kind of stuck, <laughs> and it was like, it works, oh, okay, though. yeah, I'll take, I'll take it. Yeah, I'll, sure, I'll, I'll coin that term. So. But this is like the introduction of vocals into what was known as classic vaporwave at the time. So like taking it beyond just sampling. 80s R&B and yeah, it was a uh, it was it was like it was like a direction that I mean I obviously like everybody can make whatever they want and I'm not the first to do it either. No. Deep uh, surfing, uh, deep fantasy yeah. did it like Whitewoods. Whitewoods yeah. are an early adopter yeah. as well. Yeah, and uh, I mean even like uh, I think George Clanton came out with 100 electronica like w- before all that happened too. So uh, yeah. I forget what year that was that came out. I want to say 20s. 16, 2017? I got my shirt. I got my shirt. Yeah. <laughs> fresh, fresh in the mail this morning it was, actually, to be fair. Was it Was it this morning? Yeah, it came today. That's not bad. Um, yeah, but but uh, I guess 
so I guess where I'm going with the question is that for you, perhaps, because you've already injected your own vocals into the music that you make, perhaps that transition into the live space is easier because you've got something to be doing. Even if you were just, you know, doing a sleep of mods is what we call it here. Like the, the, the guy who makes the beats, he literally just dances with a can of Red Bull and presses the space bar on his computer, <laughs> plays the black backing track without the vocals and the other guy does the heavy lift. But even if you were just doing that, like you're, you're, you're singing on top, so there's something for you to do in terms of performance do you think vaporwave like is it a hard um is it is it a hard genre of music to tra to transfer into the live space generally um it's i mean it was, it was it was interesting trying to figure it out especially like with the vocal thing because um i was doing a lot of pitch down on my vocals at the time and i was trying to figure that out and i i found a pedal online that helps me do that which is perfect for me i it was it was, it was just interesting but like I, I, I like being able to like step away and then just like sing and like I'm still doing something, still performing. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it was hard to figure it out at first, but like once you figure it, figure it out, figure it out, it like it, it gets much easier to deal with. Sure, sure. And were you aware of the noise around uh, online around the time of Electronicon? You know, that kind of row that seemed to blow up about whether it was really a vaporwave festival at all or whether music that doesn't contain samples really qualifies as vaporwave. I mean, do you remember all that stuff ha happening? I, I remember that for the, from the recent one, yeah. Yeah, I mean, does, that, that. does any of that bother you? you? You've done both. You've done all styles, really, haven't you? To me, if people are arguing about what vaporwave is, it means the scene is active. To be honest, it's busy. some the mm. people are thinking about it still. They're still like, they're still, you know, doing it, and it's it's, I, and and that that's a good thing. But on the other hand, it's like, bro, just let people make what they want to make. Yeah. Um, I get where they it's, were coming. It's the whole from. gatekeeping piece, isn't I it? I get where yeah. they were coming from because it did feel like there was a lot of people that weren't really like active in the scene. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's so like all people who like you interact with on <laughs> daily or like see daily who are a part of the event, and I get that. But at the end of the day, like. We're all here having fun, and it's it's it's. No one was trying to be malicious about anything. It's just you know, it's just. It, I mean, I, th this is the thing. If you have a massive show like that, mm -hmm. th there's two ways of looking at. It. When we spoke to George, when we interviewed him, and I've said this on the pod before, he was kind of like, look. You know, if you don't like the lineups and stuff, then go and put on a show. There's nothing stopping it. But the more, the merrier. A rising toad carries all boats, as they say. And then the other way of looking at it as well is that he's trying to put on a show at a massive space because that's the size of the audience. Therefore, he needs to think about having at least one stage where he's catering for the casual crowd that are just aware that there's a cool gig happening in Brooklyn and doesn't fucking know who Luxury Elite is and doesn't know who St. Pepsi is and maybe does know these kind of semi-crossover artists. And I think he got the balance right. And it's his party. Like, you know. He did. He, he, got a, he, got a lot of, he got a lot of like really good acts in there, I think. I think, he, yeah. I think it worked out in the end. Yes. Uh, to be honest, after being at the event, it, was, it, was, it, it all worked out at the end. And it, yeah, it's true. Yeah. You got you to gotta have, for the people who don't know what, this, like, what Vaporwave is, you got to have people who come in for that as well. So yeah, I think he, I think he got a good balance. Yeah, as being as being a performer at the event, did it feel as big as it did as an attendee? Because I, in terms of the number of hours it was on, but in the number of acts and, and just the the vastness of the space, did it as a an artist playing it? Did it feel as vast and as huge as it felt as someone that was yeah. there? Yeah, the, very at, much at, so. At the time? Very much so. Yeah, it felt mm. like it it felt enormous. To be honest. Yeah. Mm. It felt like a mainstream event, didn't it? Yeah, I felt like I was like a part of something like even bigger than like our community and stuff. And I, I, I like, don't mean that in a negative way either. Oh, using I know. the word mainstream. Uh. Yeah. I mean, it just felt like everyone came together for from the community, and mm. there were so many people. You didn't have to look very far to see people were very much invested in what they were there to see. Mm -hmm. Just happiness well, everywhere. I'm and that was just a queue for the burrito van. <laughs> they weren't well, happy in the end because that, that, that shit ran out. We queued for an hour and a half and got to the end. <laughs> they were like, two minutes before we got to the end, they were like, no meat left. And then they came up and they like, literally we were second in the queue and they're like, sorry guys, I know you've just queued for two hours, but we've got nothing left. Yeah, that was, I heard about that. Uh, I, I luckily had they had food for the artists in the back. Oh, look at you! <laughs> it, was, it wasn't like it wasn't like full meals or anything. It was just like mostly snacky stuff. But so I was like, okay, I don't have to wait in line for something. And then 
All right. The lines were crazy, but but again, a, a good sign. But we did we didn't miss Saint Pepsi though. Good. We, we we didn't get our meal. Yeah, but we, we did got get to out see there. That yeah, that's, that's, that's a win. Was, that's always a personal highlight for me as well. We got to hang out with him. We were supposed yeah. to interview him in Brooklyn uh, for the film, but we couldn't kind of make it work and he wasn't very well after the show as well oh he yeah he got he got sick after he the got show. super sick yeah um, and then we saw we caught up with him in la so it was it was nice to sort of redeem that situation in the end but yeah, yeah. just catch catching him being having lux come up to us at the uh the tape swap that indy put on the day before oh that like, was awesome. a little sign she had a little mask so i didn't know who it was and then she just showed me a phone i think it was on her phone wasn't it it was a note on her don't phone. tell anyone yeah i'm lux it's I was like, no yeah. fucking way <laughs> that's mad yeah I, I was, it was really cool to meet her like we, we, we hung out a lot uh, over the, the whole weekend it was really nice honestly I hung out with a lot of really just like people who you only see online and it's just like oh, I was really yeah, cool yeah. to just meet up with everybody again and see them all or some of them for the first time so yeah and you gotta like shout out to people like Indy who put on the other little shows around it oh and, that was awesome and the fact that George pulled one of his events that he had planned for the day before because he discovered the tapes what was on and he didn't want to spoil the community stuff so I think he yeah. lost a bit of oh, money I, didn't know that, I think did he it? lost a bit of money mm-hmm. not not talking loads of money but I think he was kind of gracious enough to recognize that the community would also want to do its own thing it was also and, uh, there was a lot of artists who were playing uh, it turned out both events okay okay and it was sure. like basically he because of like uh how like contractual stuff works for that you can't do that so Can you, not? you can't work usually you have you can't like play another show within like a week within like a hundred mile radius or something yeah wow, that's mad really? because we used to have when we had the raves and well we still have them but like when it, say when the jungle scene was going on you'd get people who would start their evening in london at eight and they'd play at the start of one rave they drive up to the midlands which is like a two and a half hour drive and then they do a set there <laughs> for an hour and then they drive back and they'd finish the night at another one and they would do probably three sets around the country of an evening and get paid like you know i don't know 500 to a grand or whatever back in those days and that's like three different raves on one night i i, I was i was saying the same thing about like i when i used to do like indie uh like i used to be part of the like indie music scene around where i was and it was just like I mean, I knew people who would leave a show and immediately go to another one, but I think it's because it was like a little bit more, uh, probably more. Ex- it wasn't like a like a like a. It, it was like a little bit more like official, I guess. Not not official. Yeah, I was going like, to say uh, with the res- with respect to Indie's show, I'm sure that he could have just put Dave was playing and like in the official documentation because a lot of the artists have got kanji and stuff. But like the taxman doesn't know. Yeah, who, you know, there's ways around it. I mean, we're getting around sampling Michael Jackson, so. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come on to that. We'll come back to that. For now. For now, yeah. Future sounds. I guess in terms of your discography, and you know, it's quite a loose term to use the word discography because you've got quite a wide ranging I guess you could say you've got quite a wide ranging sort of style and, 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 and to say it's all vaporwave is is a loose term. Yeah. And I'm I'm guessing that you've probably got quite a few influences in oh, terms yeah. of where that's come. Um I guess what intrigues us about it is understanding how you move from style to style. Um, maybe and, and sometimes even with your releases in quite a short space of time. And whether that's is that determined by how you kind of feel emotionally about stuff that's going on in in the world or in your own life at the time, or is it just I kind of like the idea of that, so I'm going to do it. It's kind of a mix of both. Uh, I mean, I've noticed that when I was in a lot happier headspace, I was making a lot more happier music. Like, I was making, like, things like Summertime EP, Summer Love, and all that stuff. I was making that. When mm-hmm. I was, like, in college, didn't have that much of a worry about a lot of things because I, um, I was fortunate enough to have, um, you know, be able to, like, afford to go to college and, like, and, and, and be out there. And it was just it was – I was having a good time, and it was a, a lot of that. And then, like, as I, like, started getting into, like, the actual, like – real world it was like <laughs> uh yeah i mean you can see like my music goes from being like happy upbeat fun- future funk to like i'm not very happy right now <laughs> <laughs> right. uh and uh it just uh <laughs> it just kind of comes and goes and, and waves kind of almost and it it like goes up and down and then at the same time i i know myself i never can stay in one style for probably longer than like three albums um three mm-hmm. are like three full releases it's just something that i just can't do i can't do like three in a row of like the same style i mean like i i i made like 
for example, like I went Void, which was like kind of a synth wavy thing, and then I went Hypnagogia, which was kind of its own kind of like semi synth wavy, semi like more vapor wavy focused kind of thing, and then Forever Nothing, which is more vapor wavy, and then it made I'm Not Going Anywhere, which was basically a folky kind of emo album. Yeah. And I just was like, oh, yeah. screw it, let's just do that. And then, I mean, even like last year, I released. Fountain View, which is Mall Soft, and then Electric Elevator, which was like MIDI wave, kind of office wave stuff, and then uh, the EP Sever, which was more of like Forever Nothing kind of style. And yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. Like a mix of like some I'm not going anywhere stuff. And it just, I, I just, I can't do one style. I, I, I know some people can do it. I just, in my brain, but, does not work that way. <laughs> but I mean, is that, I, I, I'm, what would be interesting as a follow up there is, is are you kind of inspired by other artists within the vapor world? Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. To, and to to experiment and to try that kind of style. Are you, in, are you are you directly influenced by them? But also, do you have like was there a type of music that you listened to growing up that you you're always trying to sort of bring in some of those influences? You know, I, I mean, I'm absolutely always like inspired by uh, people in the scene. I mean. Uh, for Electric Elevator, I was heavily inspired by uh, Eyeliner and yeah, uh, sure. and like and even that. some of like uh, like FM Skyline kind of stuff going on, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Um, even like just like talking with like Disco Holic, like seeing some stuff he's doing. I'm like, ooh, maybe I could like incorporate some of that. Uh, I found View was like inspired by, of course, like like Cat Corp stuff, and and yeah. and then like uh, Forever Nothing, my own Forever Nothing, and like some parts of Sever were heavily influenced by like George Clanton and stuff, <clears throat> and it's mm-hmm. it, it's. I mean, every, I get all that, but of course, then I, I do have my outside of April, even like the stuff from like my childhood and when I was younger. Uh, like, I mean, I'm not going anywhere. It's like influenced by my love for emo. I've, I've been into emo music since I was like in middle school. Same as my brother, Jay, who's who runs the label with me. He's he's exactly the same. Like My Chemical Romance, that mm-hmm. kind of that kind of thing. I, mm-hmm. I was more of a Taking Back Sunday fan. Oh, yes. Yeah. I can remember him playing them. <laughs> yeah. uh, Taking Back Sunday. And then when I got into college, I got really, 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 really into American football, like really hard. I was like, okay. oh, this is this is that good good. Who's your team? Out. Who's your team? No, the the, 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 team, yeah. <laughs> the band of American. I'm oh, joking. No, the band. The oh, man. Band. Sorry. I'm sorry. I had him. I had him. I, I had him. I, I fell for that uh, one. I, no, I, fell for I was that. too dry. I was too dry. <laughs> no, I was too sarcastic. I, I, I picked it up. I was just like, I was like oh, jeez. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, no, American football was super influential. And then I got really into a band called Brave Little Abacus. And they were super influential on me. And it. I, I, I mean, that's where, like, the I'm not going anywhere. It's, like, kind of, like, got some... It's not really mathy, but it's, like, got that kind of, like, that feel, that yeah. very, like, noodly kind of guitar. Some people don't like it, and I get that, but I just... I wanted to make it. I make yeah, an I mean, album... I make albums because I want to make them, you know? Have you have, have, have you found any influence that's come from, like, the 90s era? And I was listening to Sever today in terms of preparing for what we were doing, and there's definitely a kind of i don't know whether you heard of it but we we had, over here we had like a, a, a compilation album that was it was called pure oh, moves and it was like that. around actually, it was around that kind of pan pipe era of oh, stuff yeah. that you have a little bit of a hint of in 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 what you got and I'm, as i'm listening to it it made me then listen to that album in the afternoon because i was like man there's definitely vibes of that in there and i didn't know whether you were aware of it or it was an influence at all but that 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 period of time in music oh yeah for sure i mean i feel like most uh, at least most of the people I've talked to who make like vaporwave, they they know about pure moods. Tr- mm. Trust me, uh, pure moods. Um, I'm, I was also uh, at the same time when I was making like Sever and stuff like that. I was listening to uh, Enigma. I don't know if you've heard of yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The whole, like, the old age of innocence and oh, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I was listening to that the album mm. that was from uh, <coughs> like on loop at that time. I mean, I'm also like a late '80s stuff, like uh, like. Boys to Men, uh, New Edition, yes. stuff like that, uh, Heavy D, and all that kind of stuff. I, I got, I love my New Jack Swing stuff. That's that's the good. That's stuff. the New Jack Swing, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. That's where that's mm-hmm. where like all my mm-hmm. swing beat stuff comes in because a lot of my stuff kind of I put the swing beat and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. I got, that's what makes it drive. You get that. It's nice because you get that lower tempo, so you can chill yeah. to it. But with the swing beat, you can also groove to it a little bit and like and and shake your booty to it a little bit. You know, it's got that good in between there. I was away this weekend with my missus, and we went to this this posh hotel. And while we, while she was getting ready, I had a load of time to kill, so I got her to stick the radio on. And it was like eighties cl- magic, Martin. You know magic, magic FM. Yeah, it's like eighties radio station. Eighties smooth, like often jazz but pop as well. Have you heard of Ten City? 
Ten City. Ten City. The band Ten City, that's the way love is. I didn't know what it was. The set, I heard like from the first like four bars, I was like, what the fuck is this? And um, <laughs> I, was trying to, I was trying to find cogent enough like lyrics that I could search it out because I didn't, I can never get um, my Siri to work on my phone. So it never, it, you know, I can't, I can't command it to tell me what the track is. For some reason, it, it just doesn't work on this phone. Have you not got Shazam? That's ah, fucking years old. That is, I haven't had Shazam for like 10 ah, but years. It, but, it, but it works. All right, okay, it works. All right, Shazam, I will download Shazam. I mean, Shazam. This podcast is brought to you by Shazam. Um, other apps are available. So, it's called, so, so, so the band is called The Ten band's City, called Ten City right? and the track's called That's The That's Way Love the Is. Way love and is. I heard it and it gave me those same vibes that you're describing there, that same era of music. And it was just a beautiful song. I almost felt emotional listening to it. And my first thought was, once I found it, was send it to my brother. We're working on a future funk version of this oh, at some point. Oh, hell yeah. That, but it's like... <laughs> I, I yeah. just peeped a little bit of it. I'm, uh, yeah, definitely. The definitely, era definitely. is ripe for the mining. Like that oh, whole era. Yeah. There's still some classics that I hadn't heard. Like stuff that should have... like if they had the luck would have been pushed hard it's like all those 60s bands that fell by the wayside and only hipsters know who they are because they didn't have yeah. the marketing power behind them <laughs> yeah to be it, as big it's it's also like i feel like i got really into new jack swing and stuff sure. like really hard and, and a lot of that like late 80s early 90s stuff because my family did we didn't listen to that uh, that much mm-hmm. we mostly what i grew up with was like the beatles and like yeah, rolling same. stones in the home and exactly and maybe that. some like more like bluegrass stuff because my dad was like a bluegrass guy and then nice. and all that stuff and then classical music because my mom was really into classical and my sister listened to more like she listened to the closest thing to it which is like the boy band era at the late 90s early 2000s with like uh nsync and backstreet boys but oh. i never got into new jack swing as a kid and i finally like as an adult like because of vaporwave because of sample hunting, I started digging for it. I'm like, let me see, let me find some good stuff through here on YouTube and stuff. And I just found all these artists, and I'm like, I've I've heard some of their songs, but like I've never like dug into their discographies before. And it was just like, why why did nobody tell me about this genre of music my entire life? This is some of the best freaking shit. Oh, I love so all that stuff that was adjacent to like um, the Death Row label. Mm-hmm. So like, um, there's quite. Was it Nate Dog? He was he was he was singing mainly, wasn't he? Rather than rather than. Uh, hang on, let's have a look. Let's not give. So like, you got that like Warren G. Um, oh, that yeah. kind of style, but with the I think it was Nate Dog who did the vocals. I'm killing this. Someone who knows mm-hmm. hip hop properly. I used to listen to loads of it when I was young because my stepdad was obsessed with it. But like, someone who knows this music would be much more familiar. But like, what I'm saying here is, Boys to Men were great, and I love mm-hmm. Boys to Men. But it was very pop end. Whereas the stuff that was on the periphery of the hip hop scene had that same style and was actually a. I felt a little bit cooler. Do you know what I mean? Do you see where yeah. I'm coming from with this? There's so much good music from uh, that era. Like, like absolutely. You ever like, listen to like Montel Jordan? Yes. Yes. Man. Yes. 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 To, I loved Boys to Men, End of the Road, and all that stuff. They had a couple of other good tunes as well. But like, it all also reminded me of the shit stuff, like Color Me Bad, mm-hmm. I Want to Sex You Up, and all that stuff that they used to. I that was. Sex pr- you. <laughs> There's. The, the, like, the problem with like the new That's jack swing good. era, I'm quite happy with that. And like that kind of era of, uh, of like uh, R and B and and stuff is just like it, there's a lot of hits, but there's a lot of yeah. misses in there too. There's a lot of tracks yeah, like there what is, were there you is. thinking? Yeah, what were you thinking on that one? Yeah, because that it's one? so in, it's so since it's like so um, it's sincere. The word it almost comes across as being not sincere. It's just so like on the fucking nose like emotional mm-hmm. and it's selling that emotion very hard and i think sometimes that can come across as quite trite <clears throat> yeah it can come off as yeah yeah very yeah it's yeah. just like eh, you kind of you're going too I, hard I, I, with it I, there's a um there's a vinyl store I, i'm sure i read somewhere that your mum worked in a vinyl store when you were a kid is that right oh yeah no, like, like way, no up, way before right? i was born she used to work in a vinyl way for you but born. she uh yeah, yeah that's how we got most of the records in our house from when i was growing we have I swear to God, my 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 dad has like, I want to say like at least like two thousand records in the yeah. house or some shit, like just all mm. in boxes. I mean, yeah. they got a lot of promotional copies, and they sound so bad. I mean, <laughs> oh lord, they're crackly and. But there is some, thin. but 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 there is something about being able to go to because there, there, there's a great uh, record store near me where you can go for like two hours and just dive around and spend hours looking mm-hmm. through it and. Half the time, you don't even know what it's going to sound like, or you've never even heard them before. But you know, the guy's selling them for a pound or a dollar or whatever it is. So you just grab whatever you want to grab, and yeah, sometimes it's worth one play, mm-hmm. and then then I'll find it online. And 
you end up discovering quite a, quite a lot of music, particularly when some of the seven inches or some of the singles that we have here, because there was a, there's a huge amount of it just lying around in a second hand kind of uh, market where you can discover music that you had no idea even existed in the first yeah. place, particularly around New Jack Swing as well, because it was so prolific. We used with, to have um, churning we used it, to have a music and video out. exchange in London where I grew up, which was like you'd go into the basement. It was twenty five p a record, and you'd have those people would come in with their like sound burgers. I can't remember. Is it uh, is that? Um, I don't know what that is. Audio te- audio audio technica. The, the audio technica. The, yeah, they they had like a portable record player. Oh, which was okay. basically you just plug your earphones in. It's battery operated, and what you'd find is that you'd have proper like you know vinyl heads would go into these basements and they'd know like because I, I used to know a lot of them i used to look for jungle records so you'd be scrolling through and you'd be looking at the little fine print on the inner circle and if it had like rar i'd be like right that's slamming vinyl rec that's remix records and i'd know <laughs> the label based on the two or three letter code so you'd have people doing that and you'd have people who had the, could afford these little portable record players and then they'd pump the music louder and louder if they saw people doing it because they wouldn't really, they'd be annoyed at themselves for missing something that was valuable down there. But you could right. just plow through 25p a record and they had tens of thousands of them. But it, it was just like, that was my Sundays as a kid every every uh, kind of every weekend and it's been killed off a bit by we have like charity shops here I don't know if you have the same thing like Goodwill stores yeah, is that the uh, same kind of we vibe have like a thrift store. we have like yeah. thrift stores everywhere and that's where I find most of my vinyl nowadays but have they got wise to the fact that stuff's like they think that things are worth money now because they've looked at a couple of records because I went into a charity shop the other day and it was like a Kylie Minogue single and this must have sold millions of copies and they were trying to charge twenty pounds for it, and I was like thinking to myself, and not, not. I just want to be very clear: I was not thinking of buying this record. No, I'm, I'm, I s- and also that there is nothing wrong with Kylie because ultimately she's a very successful musician. It's all good. It's I mean, all twenty good, bucks but, though for an old but 20, 20 quid exactly, 20 for a record but, that's probably yeah. a fifty p record. But they've they've got the vibe that records of fashionable and so they're just pricing everything up so those bargains aren't really there anymore which is a shame they they have gotten worse here too um but the thing is i never look for the popular stuff so yeah, you mm-hmm. always get like the the little smooth jazz record yeah, that's man. like tucked away in there for a buck and it's like yeah that's that's what i'm here for and uh, right. yeah play the, the, the the place I go to has a like a world music section, oh, yeah. and like and there's and there's stacks of like he and I, I like to think that the guy's using discogs and checking out what he needs to check out. But there's some weird like Korean and Japanese stuff in there, and it's always amazing to go and grab mm. whatever is in there because it's just half the time it's shite, but you know it, you can listen to it and it's it, it's worth a few plays. But you'll come across a gem every now and again. I, I always <coughs> look for like the one with the coolest album art first. Yeah, same. Like, at That's the, the, at the least, if the album sucks ass, at least I got some cool art. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Future. Let's um, let's do a hard right hand turn. So you've um, kind of made that transition away from sampling. We were talking about this a bit before. Mm-hmm. Um, you're less... I'm not saying that you don't sample anymore at all. I don't think that's entirely true, is it? Or uh, No, I, I, I do it mostly just on the side for fun. Um, yeah. I have an, another artist name I go under, Ghost Enterprise, that I do for sample-based stuff. But I haven't released cool. anything in a while because I've been so focused on for sure, my non-sample sure. stuff. So. But I, I'm kind of intrigued by the fact that you've made that transition from heavily sampling, uh, like classic vapor, future funk. You know, you, you've dabbled in all of those those styles, mm-hmm. and you've moved into this kind of sample free stuff. Like, I, I'm going to ask you straight up: Was that a commercial business decision? Are you protecting your future earnings because you don't want to be fucked over by copyright, or was that a creative choice because you just got bored? Um, it was. It was more creative choice than it was a financial choice. Um, uh, mostly because, like, I was kind of well. It was, it was a challenging myself kind of thing. It was like a let's see if we can make this without the samples. And it, it was just like I remember sampling at one point, and I'm like, I want to just have this part of the song. And it was like, oh, I can't just take that part of the song. And it's like, well, if I can make the entire song entirely then i could just have that one part of the song and then just Mm -hmm. drop in and out other parts and it's like i just i wanted the more control of like what was going into it um and as as i was like doing it more it was just like it was just like oh yeah this is this is i i I was enjoying the making the uh whole track instead of just sampling kind of thing um 
like, like I mean, it's like a whole different mind process to to be honest. Like sampling versus like uh, versus making wholly original work. But yeah, I just I, I wanted to. It was more so like a creative choice, and um, and at the time when I think when I first started <laughs> making sample free stuff, I honestly was trying to make like synthwave stuff uh, before, and then it just it all it just never worked out for me. Uh, except for Void, kind of had some of those influences in it. Yeah, but I can see um, that. but it it it. it I mean, I didn't really start making money, money on it until like Hypnagogia came out. To be honest, and I was like, "Oh, I was like, okay." So, but it was it was more just it was more like a creative choice on it. Uh, the 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 um the monetary stuff was more just kind of like a, a like a bonus, and it was like kind of thinking about. It. I was like, "Oh, well, I don't have to worry about getting DMCA'd now." And uh, I think there's people with a lot lower sales levels than you that worry about it, though. You know, like yeah, you're, honestly, you're pretty. You're pretty hit. successful, like in and you and you're touching. You know, you're playing at, when you're playing at events like Electronicon, and you're having the success in selling out multi formats. You know, I'm, I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. You, you've yeah. you've been in the game for a while. You're a popular a artist while. who carries a crowd exactly, and <laughs> so there are people way lower down the the food chain. And I, again, not not a judgment point, but more a they'll get there you know everyone's on their own journey to mm-hmm. somewhere but like at this point there are people who are much more worried about sampling i mean do you do you have any views about that side of things i mean so, epic's just taken over Bandcamp. what's your I've, feeling about that i've been i mean i've been sampling you know i've had made sample music since like 2014 i started making stuff under damn mason in 2013 so i've been doing this for 10 years yeah Fuck. Uh, and uh, but I'd be like 2014 is when I actually started <laughs> sampling because my or- first stuff was actually just original stuff. Um, but in that those like eight years, eight or so like year, eight nine years of sampling, like I haven't gotten hit. I've had friends who've gotten hit. I'm touching wood for you right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, that sorry we, is that a, is that a phrase that you use in America? No, I've never heard that phrase before. Oh shit! I would say Do you know what? That, that sounds like it could mean something very different. I, know, I think the, the American version of what knock wood on means wood? makes that sound. I don't know. Quite, okay, oh, so I think I feel like I feel like a lot of our audience might think I just said that I'm touching, touching your wood, wood, which I'm you, not. I, I get what, it now. I get it now. I, if you knock on wood, it's like knock it, for knock good on luck. Wood. Okay, yeah, that's, that's our. I mean the best. I mean the best for you. Yeah, if, if yeah. something yeah, happens, I'm that's like shit. I'm like, touch wood. Let's touch wood. But uh, after nine years of of, of, sam- of having sample based music still on my band camp, still available, I haven't gotten hit with anything. I think the main time that anybody hit, that I know has actually gotten hit with anything, it's Marvin Gaye. Don't sample Marvin Gaye. Uh, <laughs> or <laughs> it's been a very, for lack of a better term, <clears throat> not like l- very lazy flip it's very you didn't do much to it which is not a something i really care about in the scene some people will be like oh they didn't do much to that i was like bro it's vaporwave what do you come, come yes, on and, and especially heard the early stuff? stuff yeah like go uh, back to late night delight lux oh, yeah. lux is very talented and her uh, style of of chopping up and stuff is like transformational but in the early days that album as much as i love it you mm-hmm. would would not have a hard time as a lawyer if you wanted to saying that Oh, um, yeah. You haven't done very much to All Night by Michael Jackson yeah. there. I mean, they don't rock, rock with you. Sorry, rock with you. No, for real. It's, it's, there's, um, it's really, but it, like, it's usually like they're not very transformative at all with it. Or, um, it's like a, and it's usually a very popular song or a currently yeah. popular song. And that's usually what gets people in trouble. But for the most part, no one's been sued that I know of. Uh, for like monetary amounts or anything, it's been mostly just uh, cease and desists. Just, yeah, we've like, had a couple of cease and desists. Mm-hmm, just here and there. Cease and desists. We, we've had and then one you just take art. it down and you just don't mention it ever again. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we were, we were asked we were asked nicely by Cisco, the, well, the, by the composer of the Cisco Hold music, mm-hmm. um, to take down the ability to pay. He was fine because he knew that we were doing it for charity. We did a compilation where artists did different covers of that hold music, basically. This is the Opus One thing. Yeah, Opus okay. One. And, and he was mm. really good about it, but he just asked that we stopped taking money. Start charging money for it? If, if, even if it is for charity. It's like, you're, you've raised your money now. Can you can you just, you can leave the album there even. Just make it That's free. honestly the nicest I've seen anybody with yeah, that man. stuff. Because usually it's just, take it down or else we're going to sue you. Exactly, and we had a we did have a letter from uh, is it Capcom that deals with Resident Evil? 
Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so they sent us a very nicely worded email giving us 14 days to remove an album by Mono Memory. But then what I did was, and this is bad, I shouldn't really say this, I did a bank out message saying, we've been asked to take down this album in 14 days, so it, I would suggest that you download it now before it's removed from your collection. <laughs> and we only had like a thousand digital sales thereafter. Like that record goes for hundreds of quid <laughs> on Discogs now because oh it's God. banned. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't even. Can't. Yeah, it's weird to take it down. The uh, it doesn't exist. They did you a massive favour by simply sending you a little nice letter-headed email. Very nice. It was very oh, nice. And then they, yeah, yeah, that was it. Like, thank you for complying. And that was it. Have you had anything like that yourself? No, not a single time. Only time I've ever had issues with anything was just like YouTube auto copyright stuff. Right. Um, right. And I've had it happen to my original music before, and I'm like, what the. F- like what was going on with that? Is it auto taking down your own content? And I'm like, this is my and song, stuff. and it, what it would be is like because like I remember, oh god, for the birthday, I did that birthday uh, live stream a while ago. I got freaking, I got freaking content taken down. It like muted the stream and cut the uh, the scene out of my original performance because in the background I used a stock stock video that apparently was used in some Indian TV show. And they no, they, they, claimed they claimed it, and I was like, "You can't claim a stock the fuck? photo." Like, what the fuck? Anyway, it's so complicated, isn't it? It, it is, and it, I mean, that's it's gotten worse. I feel like yeah, I feel like Instagram's full of people complaining about their own music being taken off their own channels. I had a problem with TikTok. The, uh, yeah, I I put one of my I was going to promote Electric Elevator too, and I was like, "Oh, I'll just." I'll use the music in the video that I edit so it's easier so it syncs up and everything. And I was going to post it on the TikTok and it was like, it is a video muted, can't be seen because this song is <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And I was like, bro, I made the fucking song. Like, what the <laughs> fuck? Uh, it was stupid. So now, no. like, I have to just sync it with, like, the audio from the TikTok. Uh, uh. And it sounds a bit, yeah. It's a, and the whole. It doesn't always sound that great. I, I, I think across well, different genres, be, be it vaporwave, synthwave, whatever it might well be, everyone's had the same complaint yeah, in one way, have. shape, or form. Yeah, they yeah have. it's um, it's ironic. I, I get why, but it's um, it's kind of comical. Mm-hmm. Not at the time, but maybe with hindsight. Yeah, hindsight so, like- just to tie up this um, this kind of sampling conversation, then I, I did read uh, somewhere that. Uh, I, w- I can't remember that. Andrew Daly, I think his name is, wrote, did an interview with you a couple of years back, uh, an okay. online interview. And you sa- he asked you if you had um, anything that you'd like to change about the music industry. And you were like, bold caps lock, copyright rules. And mm-hmm. the, I, I think what you were talking about was that, that whole notion. I don't know if it's the same in the UK as it is in America, but of like 70 years after death. Uh, it's that's like when stuff goes into something. yeah they've changed it recently mm. I think as well that stuff's always changing every time I mean, Mickey Mouse gets closer to the copyright <laughs> they're trying to change it because they, they yeah. want to keep Steamboat Willie they're, they're doing some I, there's some funny shit with that and I'm, but I'm I wouldn't like, doubt that's what it is yeah that kind it, of thing it, it would is, make it perfect sense the Disney sense. Corporation they do it all the time they, yeah. they're the reason why it is as long as it is which is ironic because they literally based most of their stuff off of public domain shit Anyway, well, that's the thing, right? <laughs> but um, I, I, I hate. I want to make a Disney Wave long. album. I want to make I hate... a Disney Wave album. Oh God, don't! You're, you're literally that album will be unlistenable <laughs> anywhere. I have thought about making an album that you literally can't post anywhere or listen anywhere, where it's literally yeah. just easily DMCA shit. I want to make I it the last ever that. release on uh, My Pet Flamingo. Will you collab oh, with me? <laughs> I don't want you guys to get shut down. <laughs> No, no. Uh, just 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 do it physical only, and then no one then no one gives yeah. a no shit. No one will ever hear it. Just, you know, no, no, go on. Tell, tell us though. Tell us tell us what you think it's, about. It's really rough here. Um, there's also no small claims court in yeah. uh, in the U.S. for copyright law. So that means if somebody bigger than you were to use like your track, like in the background, like a commercial or something like that, there's nothing you can do unless it's like. Because no lawyer's going to go with you for that. Because there's not going to be enough money to be made off that. So somebody could steal your song in the U.S. if you're a smaller person, and it you have no rights to it. Basically, there's a what there's nothing you can do because you don't have the money to do anything about it. So copyright law is literally only here for corporations, at least yeah, in the sure. U.S. Mm. So it and as an artist, it's like, bro, like I reference p- other music all the time. Like and what's considered copyright is like so vague in art. It's like, it's like. I, all right, someone taking an entire song and slowing it down. I'm going to be real. Sorry, Vaporwave people. That's pretty much 
like that's what I understand as like being copyright like strike because you literally took a whole song and just slowed it down. Um, but like, oh, I'm influenced by that song and I use the same chord progression in a slightly similar melody, but not the same melody. But I can get sued for that, which is fucking stupid. It's really it's really dumb. Like even like it's if I like reference a lyric or something, it's like I could get sued for that. There was a track recently, and I can't remember the guy's name. He's a Canadian pop star, and I think he's a bit of a creep. Like, his video is a bit creepy as well. But he... <laughs> he I'm not doing a good job of remembering this. He'll come back to me in a second. <laughs> anyway, Blurred Lines. That was the tune with Pharrell. Oh, uh, yeah. Was it with Pharrell? Uh, and, and it, Robin it, Thicke. Robin Thick. Yeah, Robin Thick. I mean, the guy. The, 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 the that is fucking the crazy guy. to me that you you're telling me that those two tracks are identical. Like, fuck they off, man. Looking, like, there was a there was one. Uh, so Olivia Rodrigo came out with a track recently, and they were scared because it sounds because people were doing mashups of that song with Paramore song. Uh, okay, with a Paramore song, and they were like scared about this. So they gave Paramore a writing credit. I'm like. Bruh, Paramore did not invent that style of music, like at all. Like they didn't, like they didn't get sued by Paramore. Um, they just, uh, they were getting, they were afraid of getting sued. And then another band came out later who said that, oh, that song sounds exactly like our song, and it, it didn't. They were sounded similar, but not the same thing. But it's like, um, bruh, you do get some bad cases. Like if you look back into like Led Zeppelin's history. They literally stole they, they literally took, whole uh, songs, whole melodies, the whole chord progression, even the solos and the lyrics. Like there was no question that they no, they, they, they that's, off. that's it, it's it's such like a, a a touchy like thing. But to me, honestly, I feel like at some point a song is no longer owned by the artist; it's owned by the public in a way, and that's where the public domain thing kind of comes in. You know what I mean? Yeah, I I'm just feel like the length of time for copyright is way too long. For sure. Way too fucking long. I feel like, honestly, uh, to me, like 30 to 40 years max. So should the Beatles be... Uh, it should be public domain. Cause, so could I do... This. Do you think that, morally speaking, I should be able to release any fucking Beatles album I want on My Pet Flamingo? I feel like you should be able to <laughs> to do covers of Beatles songs without having to pay them. Because at this point... Okay, covers, in, yeah, I think. In yeah, my life, kind of uh, at least from in my life, yeah. Beatles to me... Because they haven't played, because well, half of them are dead. Um, but uh, they're just a drum like, and bass. It band feels now. like folk songs to me more than it is like, oh, this is a pop song. Because this is like music from my my parents' era, or like or like some people's grandparents' era. And it's like, I mean, if it's gone three generations at that point, is that song even like? It's, it's it's a folk song at that point. Like, when does a song become a folk song? You know what I mean? Like, when I, I get. I, li I like the idea. I like the idea. But be careful now, because you're talking to a Beatles stan here. <laughs> like I am. They are my favorite but band of all time. Is 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 there not something about how if the band themselves sell the rights to their own music, then yeah. why do they? Then who should? Well, give I a mean, shit? the fact that Michael Jackson Who's, owned yeah. the rights to Beatles music for quite a long time. Well, mm. well he owned it for about twelve or thirteen years, and then obviously they're they're, they're elsewhere now, but. And uh, there, are, there are a huge number of bands that are just selling this. I, uh, Genesis did it last year. I'm not, I'm not sure who they sold it to. So as far as I'm concerned, if, if the band don't care, then no one else should care. And it's only and they would have sold it to some, some crazy corporation that's using it for God knows what and then suing everyone under the sun. But is it is it a 70-year... Is that is that a global thing, the whole 70-year No, it's different laws for different around? countries, I think. And... Right. I'm not sure. I'm not. The, also, you get into different arguments, which also require lawyers about things like uh, fair use. So, yeah, documentaries and stuff like that can use things. If you're telling a story, if you're being an educational, you can use stuff so they depends. can get. In. It's very, you know, like it. It's, it really can only be tested by being sued, and you don't really yeah, want that exactly. shit, exactly. especially in America. You, 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 if you, you can't afford to be you, sued, you, you, you can't you, afford to be. Can't no, afford to exactly. do it. So exactly. I mean, like, exactly. and what kind? Of, fair use is so like, like, oh, it's transformative. But like, what point do people consider trans? It's so, yeah, messy. Yeah. I ah. We could talk about it forever. It, it, it's an interesting subject. It's one that rolls around again and again and again. And we'll be back here in a year's time talking about <laughs> whether samples need to be in vaporwave or not. Oh uh, yeah. I wondered if you guys <clears throat> wanted to talk. Uh, conscious of time about the whole no, nobody here yes yeah, so piece. we should touch on that project because Chris obviously met up with you for an interview mm -hmm. in, was it in Florida it was Which in Florida way? yeah, yeah. In, uh, by, by Tampa Florida on the, on the west coast of Florida 
the... Yes, that's was, right. Was this was, was this just after the Electronicon? Yeah, yeah it, so was this was it was like a week later, down, didn't he? I think yeah, it was like a week yeah. later or something. Or like a yeah, it was when me later. and you came back. So like, I, I, and I, I said this before, but as someone who's been involved in the scene for such a long time and who's been kind of had, you've had a big part in, in helping this, to to shape the uh, shape the way the scene has developed you know like you've 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 had you know you've been part of the original future funk and classic vapor side of things you were one of the people who popularized the idea of vaporwave point 2, 2.0 and and com, com, combining original composition with with original vocals like what is it that you think makes Vaporwave so unique and, and enduring as well? Because you've been doing it for, for 10 years. The scene has been going on for a little bit longer than that even. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, to me, honestly, it, it is the scene itself that, that really kind of keeps it going. It's, I mean, it's the people in it, obviously. Like, now, like, from a musical standpoint, I've heard so many different styles come out, especially even in the last, like, few years since like the pandemic and stuff like that i've seen like different styles like become coming to the limelight you got <laughs> I, I hate the name of this genre but uh barber beats uh yeah, it's like a, yeah. i mean that that's been around honestly that style but it, it's it's in the limelight you got um oh, i forget what they're calling it but it's like the one with like the like kind of like the drum and bass idm feel with the drums in the background it's it's similar to, like esprit style stuff but like a little bit more like what it, so uh, slow down slow down not jungle speed not drum and bass it, speed it's it's like it's like it's not it's slower yeah it's not break core so not the break core stuff because we we no, we are involved in thing. vapor but like, rave but you got like uh yeah like vapor <laughs> vapor rave stuff and uh, it's just it's just like it, I've seen like so many different styles come come and go too like yeah. I remember I remember in freaking like 2015 I mean it's still a big style I remember like 2015 if you weren't making ambient you weren't gonna be talked about at all I remember it was like Sam- <laughs> sampling rainfall yeah if you, if you weren't doing that stuff then... every, every everyone released an album of rainfall back in 2015 oh man it was it's really it's so funny because like that was like the time where you're either making ambient music or you're making house future funk music from what yes. I remember it yes. was like you're, you're going edits. one way or the other, yeah. Or you're making, are you sticking to the classic style? And it was just, it was just really funny. But isn't that the, what's interesting about it? The fact that all those styles can be completely different, and yet you'll see the same people. Like if there's a, there could be like a a more soft gig. I don't know if that's a thing anywhere, but you could have a future front gig. Like we went to the Young Bay one, mm-hmm. and there's loads of people there who are like, you know into into just as much into their disco edit future funk side of things as they are into their <clears throat> death dynamic shroud mm-hmm. heavy shredded cuts like and chops. definitely definitely it's and, a, it's, and everything in between and beyond that's, that's mm. why I, I think the scene is just nice about that because they're open to like different music styles i feel it's like oh you you want to make this kind of style of music okay i'll give it a try you know like it's it's very open and, and it's, that's why the scene itself is like what really keeps it driving I, I, I think I found, and, I, and I'll be honest in saying that I, I came into Vaporwave through Synthwave and I'd done a huge amount of Synthwave live events and, mm-hmm. and that sort of thing, but there was nothing more interesting, exciting, and just generally kind of, uh, this makes me, it makes it sound too, too... Uh, open your heart. I'm not sure what the word Open is. your heart, fake man. Yeah, opening, opening my heart, that's what it is. I uh, Electronicon, I loved it. It was absolutely fantastic. And when we we did a, a Future Sounds event in London, and it was uh, the last one we did back in November, it was more it was more definitely heavily vapor focused, and the crowd was just amazing. It was unlike it, you know, the synthway scenes quite dude heavy, if you know mm-hmm. what I mean. And we it was completely different. It was it, so it felt like you had people who were happy. Vast. Happy and comfortable oh, in their skins yeah. and who they are. And they were and we were all outsiders. You know what I mean? Like in a sense that everyone Definitely. was welcome and you had this cool group of people. Has, but that has stuck with me for God, what's been now six months. You haven't stopped uh, banging on about it. Six months. And I and it, I, I, I won't shut up about it. I won't. I I, I swear I, I won't. But so I think you're right. There's the the, the scene and the people themselves are, are what drives it and it's I've yeah I, 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 I found it I think, revolutionary. I think yeah. as long as the scene, um, I know people. There's always those arguments in the scene. What constitutes vapor is it? But I think as long yeah. as the scene keeps their minds open to what can and cannot be vaporwave, I think that's what will keep the scene alive. It'll it'll change shape. Like the the, the sound of the scene will change a lot, but that's what keeps it alive. If you keep the sound the mm-hmm. same, if you tell people you can't make that, then the scene will die. 
And, and you need to have constant changes in the scene and people trying things and bringing things and things coming and going. It's just going to, it's just, it's a, it's a living, breathing scene. It's great. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And those rows only prove that it's alive. I know. Okay. So we've got, we've got a few questions from, um, from, uh, listeners and from some people who couldn't we could obviously couldn't have us all pile in to meet dan as much as we everyone wanted to we had to draw lots to decide who got the opportunity and me and fakeman won um i, I, I lost a finger for oh, it wow yeah know, did it grow back or? no i, I didn't need oh, it. that's I good didn't need it. okay <laughs> we've got a question from cheddar man 420 cheddar where man. did the insp <laughs> I, love I love it i love it Cheddar Bear in mind, these are their band camp. Like, okay. uh, that's their yes. band camp. I, I don't think... I don't I'm think sorry, that, that's a great name. Yeah, I don't think it's Mr. Cheddar Man. <laughs> and it's also, I think... Hang on, I'm, I'm trying to get my phone in. My eyesight's Cheddar not what it was. Man. It kind of looks like it might be like a cheesy string man. You know like those cheese strings? That might oh, be... Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. like the like the little, oh, yeah. Those those ones, little, yeah, yeah. That might be the avatar. <laughs> they split yeah. off and then... Oh, my yes, God. loads of split ends on them. Um... Where did the inspiration? <laughs> where did the inspiration for Void and Forever Nothing come from? Also, are those albums related? And George told me you don't like Torium. Why is that? <laughs> well, so Void and Forever Nothing are somewhat related. So um, they're both ref me reflecting. So this was a long, long time ago. I yeah. have I've, I've been in honestly I've been in the same relationship with uh, with my wife uh, since like uh, high school. But I had a relationship before that. It was like the first time, like, yeah, I ever had like a serious relationship with somebody, and it fell apart, and it was just like things just kind of disconnected. And both Void and Forever Nothing are me looking back on those times and how I kind of dealt with it. And I, I, I it's they're literally just both breakup albums, and they're about the same one. And like, there's like, um, like all the songs on them are just about like different aspects of going through a breakup. To be honest, uh, like you know, uh. Wishful thinking is like the song. Wishful thinking is about like uh, like hoping that we can make this stuff work, and it just doesn't work. And then, and uh, uh, the song off of Forever Nothing, I, I think like uh, what is it called? Uh, I can't remember my own song names. Uh, the song Oh No, It's You is literally just like about like when you go to a place after the breakup and you see them somewhere, and you're yes. like, yes, and you're like, this God. is oh no, it's you, fucking Man. awkward. Uh, <laughs> I and had like, that once. I worked with her and then she left and she moved to London. And it was like that. I had this, it was like I, I had a proper full on, I would say, a breakdown over it. Like I mm. was like, I've been such a fucking idiot investing this much energy that clearly wasn't reciprocated mm -hmm. and then found myself in that same space. And then she ended up getting a job back in the same part, same in Wales, like very closely connected oh, to no. mine. I was just like, this is my moment to leave and uh, push this full time. I'm, I'm walking away from this kind of thing. It's, it's, it's literally, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I was like referencing and stuff. It's like the, yeah. the, the, the feeling of like the relationship obviously starting to fall apart. And then like the aftermath of the relationship where it's just like, it's you're like, picking oh, the pieces man, back I together. I, I got to my, put myself together. Uh, um, and then just like, oh man, I hope I don't see them again. Or like, and like sometimes yeah. you gotta see them again. And it's like you for like, because like mm. especially like at my age, it was like a school age thing. And it's like, oh, well, they might be at be at this event or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then wow, just finally in the end, just accepting that it's over. Like with uh, the the final track on Forever Nothing, Forever Nothing is literally just like we're nothing now, and I just have to learn to deal with that. That we're there's nothing between us anymore. And it's it's. It's just. A it's, I kind of feel like that's like a really fertile uh, sort of exploration ground for creative ideas. But mm -hmm. I wonder, like, when you're looking back on something reflectively ten years on, and you're in a relationship, like you said, you've been with your wife for a long time. Mm -hmm. How how does she feel about you? Kind of. It, well, she it, knows the songs aren't about her. No, exactly. <laughs> so. But she's she and she appreciates the fact that I, I think I don't think anyone when you're older, like I don't think anyone would begrudge someone having a place in their life memories and understanding of how they got to be the person they are for the first mm -hmm. time they had heartbreak 
so that's okay but i mean is it funny like talking and saying look i'll just you know this is about um sally again <laughs> do you know what i mean do you know what? i'm being facetious yeah, here and I, I don't want to belittle because i like i said i think this is a a beautiful creative space to explore and i think and i i threw my own experience in to show you that everyone as you know everyone understands this feeling it, i carry it now even though I, i've long been in a new relationship I think that's why I wanted to make these two albums because it's it's something that I I feel like is very relatable. Um, it's something that other people can listen to and be like, oh, I've been there, and it's, and, and and it being from real experiences, I think it makes it personal on the same way. I mean, most of my albums are uh, ever since I started doing like vocal focused vaporwave, all of my albums have been very personal and yeah. what they're about. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it's I just. It's it's interesting. Like I I've I've even told myself like maybe you should stop <laughs> referencing that time period. You made two albums about it. I think I think you're good on that. Just focus on like the more m modern things. Like that's what like hypnagogy is about. That's what like uh, I'm not going anywhere is about. Um, Sever is sort of a breakup album, but I'm using certain influences from my life that I was going through because I was uh, at the time going through some things with uh, with a label I was working with. And it was just, I was kind of using that and then using like the setting of like a breakup in a way as like kind of reflecting on it. So I was kind of reflecting on two things at a time with that. Um, sure. And do, yeah. It just, do, does it, does it, or did it feel cathartic? Like did, did it, did it serve a purpose for you personally oh, yes. to get it out of the, out of your system? And so you feel like yes. that's the moment in time there, there it is. And I, I feel like I've closed that door and it's all good. Yeah. It, <coughs> it helps me. Um, it helps me deal with, whatever I'm going through at the time. Um, even if it, like, even reflecting on something old, it's like, you know, I'm still like, mm -hmm. I'm doing some emotional stuff and it's just helping me get through that. I mean, like, uh, I mean, hypnagogia was all about like a thing that I was going on at that moment. Uh, I'm not going anywhere. Literally that album. I think it, I, I know like it's not my most popular album, but it is an album that I know personally saved my fucking life. So wow. when I was making it, uh, cause I was like, I needed to tell myself these things. Like, yeah. Stop bottling up your fucking shit. Talk yeah, to your sure. fucking yeah, wife about the problems yeah, you're man. having. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's what that whole album was about. Like, cause and that I, literally got me out of my like depression hole that I was in for like three years. Um, but that's an amazing thing. That's a beautiful thing. And it, it helps. It helps a lot. And uh, it, it and like Sever was literally just like, let me like help like rationalize like what I'm going through with this this label that I'm just departing ways with and and just uh, let me just you know like rationalize like i did with like void or something like that because it, it, it is kind of like that where it's like because i remember like when i found out like it wasn't part of that label anymore it was just kind of like oh man that kind of like hits you in the gut and it's like oh i was having fun working with this person and it was like but like they <clears throat> kept ignoring me on some stuff and it was just like i kept getting hit in the gut and it, it, it's it, it it well it wasn't like a, a a love love kind of like relationship like a, a like a that kind of relationship Mm -hmm. It was it was it was still like a different type of relationship, and I just wanted to like kind of reflect on it in some ways and stuff. Yeah, no, 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 and that's the beauty, I think, and and that kind of goes back to the question we were asking before, which is, how do you extend beyond just doing sample based stuff and 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 introduce your own personal elements and bring that to like a live performance as well? You can really carry parts of yourself through into that, and I think that you're the way you talk and the way you're willing to embrace and, and explore and then hopefully uh, correct and sort of start to feel better about the emotions that you're kind of experiencing. Mm -hmm. I think that's a beautiful thing. And you wear your heart on your sleeve, which I think <laughs> is why people fall in love with your music because they understand that there's a lot of heart and emotion that goes into it. Yeah, mo all, all of it. Like, is, is literally You're not just making music that sounds cool. I'm and just, it does I'm, sound I'm cool. I'm doing it to right, like yeah. help myself like deal yeah, with man. whatever I'm dealing with. And I like the. It sounds cool too, you know. Yeah. Well, it's a bit of both. If, you, if, if you have if, if you have to spend so long, ultimately you're spending quite a long time creating music and tracks. You know, it, it, it's your life for a set period of time, mm -hmm. right? It's you, you're immersed in that, so it's, it's almost like a snapshot. It, it, it needs it needs to do some good, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. What it doesn't do is answer the whole touring, <laughs> the touring question. Though, right? Why don't you so like touring, Dan? Uh, so the main reason I don't like touring. Um, I prefer writing and producing. Uh, sure. I love playing live. Don't get me wrong. Playing live is one of my. It's it's the, the the feeling of being there in front of people, is one of the most amazing experiences. Especially like at the all the econs at the Groove Continental I did, 
uh, even the, the smaller shows that I did in Orlando before all that, it was amazing. And, and I, I, but I love writing and producing <laughs> more. Yeah. Um, and touring is just, it's, it's a long period of time where I can't do that. Uh, my wife has to work. So like she can't come with me. So I would, I would be away from my wife for a long period of time. And the other thing is, especially in the post pandemic world, touring is insanely expensive yeah. and you could mm. lose you could just not make any money doing it. And I hate to like bring up, like talk about the money and stuff like that, but it's, if I can't afford to do it, I can't, well, it's I'm not, not going to do it. Yeah. It's not it's a not holiday. It's not a holiday. Going around, it's, it's, traveling it's around factual, America, yeah. driving long distances between and cities in a van is not, is not a holiday. If you get sick, you have to hold up somewhere. Um, especially like, if you get sick with like COVID or something like that, you, you're going to have to be stuck somewhere. I can't, I can't perform in a cold. I do singing. I can't perform with a cold, even if it's just yeah, a for cold. Sure. Like, for sure. I, I can't even. I mean, I could try. But to reassure your fans who want to see you live, you you like doing sort of standalone oh, gigs. You love I it. love doing. I do. I love doing like like one gig at a, at a time. You know, kind of so I can then build up and like get my myself going for that one gig and really focus on just like I right, let's get this really good because I feel like also like if I did my my kind of sets night after night, I would I feel like they would lose their luster just because of it becoming like a a normal thing for me it becomes almost like a uh, like a job do mean, in a do you mean like Oasis having to play Wonderwall every day for their whole life <laughs> yeah it's like I'm playing the same song again I'm playing the same song yeah. again and it feels yeah. like it would lose a lot of the emotional impact that because when I'm on stage I I try to like become like a part of the music and like really try to like get the emotions that I I've had when I was making <clears> those songs out and I, I, it's very like it's really nice as like a relief because like obviously like, building up to a, a, a big show it's like a lot of stress and then when you finally get that out on the stage and you let the emotion just kind of take over it but I can't do that every night no no that's fine uh, it'd just be too much it's it's just it's just too much <laughs> um and and it it doesn't it's unaffordable for me good answer I think that's fair I think we covered that one off no, all right well, th- no, no, thank no, no, thank you to Mr. Cheddarman420 for the question. Um, <laughs> this name. one's from this one's from Jay, my brother. He asks you, "What is your favorite action movie lift shot? Are you a fan of the one in Speed, Towering Inferno, Drive, or the Atta- or Attack the Block? These are films which presumably all include scenes <laughs> involving so like, elevators. Like the, the panning, the panning, like elevator. I oh, like the scene in shots. Sorry, yeah, we call it lift. Oh, we call it a lift. Yeah, lift. I was, th- I was thinking like a crane shot, like a hu- oh, like no. Like, I think oh, he's oh, talking. Yeah. yeah. So this question specifically relates to your recent release on my I pet mean, flamingo be- electric best, elevator. Best, ele- <laughs> best elevator shot is probably from The Shining when the doors open and the Ooh, blood yeah. blows out. And the blood comes that's, out. That's probably one of my favorite. Me, me and my wife love The Shining. So Okay, that's the same here and that is better than any of the examples he gave. Although I love the um, the gratuitous violence of the scene in Drive when he absolutely smashes him to a pulp. Was there the one lift. in The Matrix? Was there one in The Matrix? I, I haven't seen it for too long. It's been a while. I, yeah, I'd like to say there was, but I, I wouldn't want to be quoted. On I don't want to. No, that's for sure. I feel like there <clears> was. Although, the, although the, the the one in Speed, the whole opening sequence to Speed in terms of the, the credits, that's all just a lift shaft going down really fucking slow. I've got one as well. I've got one. Is it one of the Omens? Omen 4, something like that. And then there's the lift. There's like a metal... Um, wire across that that traverses the whole of the lift and it breaks free from the cable and it carries its weight and it builds momentum and it chops the lift in half chopping (laughs) someone at the waist in half oh lord I am pretty sure that fucking happens in Damien one of the Damien the Omen films (laughs) there's a terrible terrible movie uh, I think it's an M. Night Shyamalan movie uh, called I think it's called Devil Okay. And it's about yeah. a bunch of people okay, stuck yeah, yeah. in an elevator and the lights yeah, go yeah. out and somebody <laughs> dies and they come I, I want to say it's an M. Light Shyamalan. I don't think... I don't know. Though. Yeah, no, Do you know what? Joe, it's, Joe's it's, going to want you back on his podcast. Uh, We're going to have to get you on ele- <laughs> elevating lift safety. Oh, Lord. Uh, spoilers yeah. on it. Uh, yeah. Big spoilers. I hope none of you here... Cover your ears. And you, uh, yeah. Uh, it was there's, the a the we, there's a lot of crossover. There's a lot of vapor fans, like vapor heads who are proper into their elevators. Oh, yeah. They, so. they love the movie Devil... By, by a, M. Yeah. Night Shyamalan. Yeah. It's such a M. Night Shyamalan. My favorite. It's just so. It's, it's just so funny. The, the the whole reason why if there's a guy there. He drops a piece of toast with the jam on it, and it falls on the jam side down or like something. <laughs> 
or, and, and he's it falls on the wrong side and says that's a bad omen and then the whole it's, people start oh it's such a i love that shit one more question for you. This is All from right. Glenn. Glenn, who designed the uh, the tape cover art for Electric Elevator Fantastic One and Two. Job. Yeah, there you go, Glenn. You got another shout out there, mate. Play up Pompey as well. That's a little message for him. He'll understand. <laughs> I like that. Um, he's asked, so he wants you to visualize uh, a moment. You're trapped in a lift, okay, <laughs> for twenty four hours. Okay, presumably with him. I think. Oh. Oh, I'm my. not sure. I mean, actually, no, sorry, that's not specified. You can be on your own. <laughs> you're in a lift. You're trapped in there for 24 hours. Tell us and Glenn, what are the three albums that you're taking to listen to? In your I lift mean, 24 excursion. hours is not that long. So I, could, I, could I know. I also thought that is actually quite a long time for three albums. Like, they've got to be thing. long albums. No, presumably albums. You've, got, you need, you've, you've only got three albums. You're stuck in a lift. I guess he's really shoehorning the uh, elevator <laughs> pun in. <laughs> So let's let's indulge Glenn here. Uh, let's I'll play indulge. his game. Uh, You're stuck in the lift, okay? Uh, well, uh, New Edition's Heartbreak, <clears throat> nice, is is one of them. Uh, probably, probably American football. American football. What's uh, your team again? Uh, which team? Hey, he's gonna uh, get him twice. Uh, Lord We're gonna get him twice. Uh, the Raiders is mine, by the way. I gotta think. What what else would I? Oh really? Jeez. What would be an album? Uh, Brave little abacus. I just got back from the discomfort. Uh, okay. I'm all right. That's a that's a fantastic album. I could listen to that on loop for days. So that'd probably be the three because I can listen to New Edition on loop. I can listen yeah. to American Football on loop, and I can listen to Brave little abacus on loop. I nice. could do. I could, if I'm stuck in the elevator for three days, I'll I'll listen to those albums. I guess the argument for me would be, ideally, you've still got. Like internet connection, so you can still Spotify the fuck. Whatever. It's, it's, I mean, you're, you're not, you're not, you're not indulging in the spirit of this, okay? <laughs> the cell thing. I, I, I know that. Yeah. You stay out. Also, of it. I'm, 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 I'm seeing Glenn this weekend, so I'm sure he'll like. I'm honestly more. He'll, he'll, he'll say something. If about I was it, stuck so. in Elliot for 24 hours, I'm more worried about figuring out which corner is going to be the uh, bathroom corner. So yeah, and you yeah, want to hope yeah, that well, that thing that happened in yeah. one of the Omen films that I can't name. I'm hoping doesn't that doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be screaming and shouting for most of it, and then. Then I'll sit down. And I'll listen to a nice album and uh, relax. And... <laughs> I am um, when when I used to be when we used to be really hungover with one of my ex girlfriends. I used to make her listen to Tim Buckley's album Lorca, which is like a fucking challenge from start to finish. I personally oh. love it, but it's um, it's a difficult listen, I think, for the uninitiated. So I'm going to throw that in your lift as well and make you listen oh, to that and, and see how you come out. So we'll link that to... You ever, but, listen, um, to, uh, you ever listen to Trout Mask Replica? Yes. I'm oh. massively... I love my beef heart. Although the, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a fan of um, what, Safe as Milk, is that the oh, one? Safe as Milk I can deal with. Yeah, I, that's I, kind I, of I more like... It's, it's still a bit experimental, but that's kind of more straight up 60 kind of power power beat like kind like, of like I, I get what they're doing in trout mask replica but it's I, too it's, much for me it's just a good, safest milk of the for world, the uninitiated so Cap, Cap, captain about, beefheart yeah. is um a, he was like a massively hard taskmaster who ran a band that were fairly popular probably mainly was it la sides i think maybe maybe west coast but they're I like a big coast, but they were like yeah. he was friends with like frank zappa yeah man he's from that okay. whole era he's right. very very like revered um musician like a songwriter and he had an amazing is it Ry Kuda was his guita- guitarist I think I who's like who was like 16 17 at the time was an amazing guitarist and he used to just be a bit of a see you next Tuesday to work for but like it, some of his albums are like super like experimental for the sake of experimental a bit like Frank Zappa maybe and that album you said was it Trout, Bar- Trout Mask Trout Record? Mask Record, yeah that. like Lorca's in the same pantheon of records in my in my mind okay but Tim Buckley is better than Jeff Buckley. You heard it here first. Oh. <laughs> oh. No, listen, Dan, it's been wonderful to spend time with you. I think we've talked more than enough about lifts. Um, I think we've covered on most things. I could have, I could have, I could, I'm sure there's plenty more that we could have discussed, but it, w- it was great to hear kind of like really honest reflection on how you allow yourself to engage with like your emotional side when you're creating music. I think that shows a depth that not everyone is able to 
to call upon and then that makes yeah. like yeah. certainly your fan base is amongst the more loyal I've noticed in the, in the Vaporwave community and I think it's because they resonate with the same kind of um, experiences we're all going through those experiences and having someone who's honest enough to put their heart on their sleeve like that I think it's um, quite inspiring to all of us and it's just yeah I still can't believe we haven't met in person even though we've been in the same room <laughs> we've been in the times. same area like, and we've uh, worked together on like four or five releases so um, but we will be in America again and um, we'll be potentially talking about launching Flamingo Fest in real life this late summer so we'll be chatting about that for sh- for sure <laughs> and if you do find yourself fancying a trip to Europe at any point we, I'm sure we can work a show around that. And, uh, I've I've never left maybe. the states, so that'd, that'd be. Have you got a passport? That is your. Oh, I do. I do. I was supposed to go to Japan in 2020, but you there know something go. happened, and then. Okay, that that that's def- that's definitely ticks the first box. Yeah, it feels like a com- definitely feels like a conversation worth having offline first. <laughs> um, but no, listen honestly. Thank you for coming along and. Um, yeah, it's just great to have you. And do you have any shout outs? Any, um, it wouldn't be right to invite you onto our podcast without asking you if you want to sell anything. Like, if you've got anything, do you want to direct anyone anywhere? This is available for, uh, I, I, I got nothing right now. Um, I know we got, we had those tapes for the, uh, electric. There's a couple too. left. There's a couple left. There's a couple but by of, the time this comes out, I think they might be sold out. I don't know. Yeah. I, was, I wasn't sure this is going to still be going. Uh, uh, that was going to still be going. But uh, other than that, right now, um, I say just go listen to Electric Elevator 2 if you haven't heard it. Check me out on Spotify. Uh, check out my Bandcamp, danmason.bandcamp.com. I have plenty of albums up there. Uh, check me out on YouTube. I have a Twitch channel, which I need to get back onto sometime soon. I've just been busy working on my next album like crazy. And uh, uh, keep an eye out this May for something with that. So. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh, can't wait to hear Ooh, it. So that's soon. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's uh, I got my ten year anniversary of being Dan Mason coming up. Shit. So happy birthday to Dan. <laughs> that's amazing. Centenary. Ten yeah. years. Yeah. Fucking hell. Yeah. We've been we've been doing our label for like nearly five years, and that feels like. Yeah, I just can't believe how much has changed in the last five mm-hmm. years. But and yet, how much has stayed the yeah, same from as well. 2018? So yeah, that's a lot has changed since I think then. Yeah, we did. We started Time Slave in 2016, and probably April 2018, I think, was my pet flamingo. 2016 so. was like a big push. I, I I know for like when the paper scene really started yeah, taking off. Sure. Then and then 2017, it was like okay, we're we're getting the things yeah. are getting moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. All right, I'm going to um, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna click stop on my. I will.